Well, we all, we all got quiet right on time. There's Father Mason's here, good. <laughs> He's the only person in Muncie that has a stone with his name engraved on it. <laughs> well, good afternoon and welcome to our Interfaith Forum today. Uh, my name is George Wolf. I'm the chair of the Muncie Interfaith Fellowship. I'm so glad to see so many of you who, despite the weather, have come to hear our guest speaker. I'd like to begin by inviting Reverend Pamela Pettijohn, interim minister at Hazelwood Christian Church, to the lectern now to offer a few words of welcome. Good afternoon. Whoa. <laughs> On behalf of Hazelwood, I just want to say how excited we are that you all have come out to join us. We were so excited when George asked us about hosting this event. And for those of you, uh, it's, it's so great to see so many unfamiliar faces. Uh, and so I know many of you are probably unfamiliar with the building. And so I just want to make sure that we all know directly out here, like you, you can see it through the window, there's a very small restroom that's for both men and women. But then if you want the larger ones, if you go back towards the main doors, just past them, you'll see an elevator and there's a men's and a women's on each side. So um, feel free to, you just never know when nature is gonna call. So feel free to take advantage of those as needed. Uh, I would encourage you all to silence your phones if you have them with you. I went off and forgot mine um, so that our time won't be interrupted. Uh, we are recording, so the great thing about that is you don't have to remember every little thing. You can always go to our Facebook page and find it later um, and to refer back to and to share it with your friends. So hopefully you're on Facebook and willing to do that. So back to George. Well, the Muncie Interfaith Fellowship would like to thank Reverend Pamela for offering to host this event at Hazelwood. Also, I'm, I am indeed grateful to Father Paul Jacobson, Rector of Grace Episcopal Church in Muncie, to Reverend Barbara Corriman, and to Wayne Meyer of the Universalist Universalist Church of Muncie, who helped to publicize this event, and to Myra Smith, who is our interfaith advocate in Hartford City, Indiana. Also to my wife who helped prepare refreshments for the reception following this meeting today. You'll notice on the table to my left is a candle that I have lit. I like to begin our interfaith events with this candle because it is a hologram that projects a rainbow colored flame. It is meant to symbolize harmony and diversity in addition to the supreme light of the divine, that image in which we are all created, which lies within each and every one of us. Our speaker today is the Right Reverend Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs, who has served as the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis since 2017. The first black woman to lead an Episcopal diocese Bishop Jennifer is a graduate of Smith College, Cornell University, and Church Divinity School of the Pacific. She has served congregations in the Diocese of Central New York, Newark, and California, and prior to her election as bishop, was director of networking in the Diocese of Chicago. Her expertise includes race and class reconciliation, and spiritual direction. Bishop Jennifer is an accomplished distance runner and triathlete and a passionate chef and baker. She is the husband of, or she is the, she and her husband Harrison Burroughs are parents to Timothy age 11. I first met, <clears throat> I first met Bishop Jennifer last summer at Chautauqua Institution where she spent a week serving as the guest minister. I was honored to perform the prelude on the soprano saxophone for one of her services. Fortunately for Bishop Jennifer, she says she likes the saxophone, which of course was prerequisite to her being invited here to speak. <laughs> She'll be speaking today on banding together to create beloved community. 
for coming to Muncie today is indeed timely for at least two reasons. First is, the Febr is that February month, February is the Black History Month. And second is the fact that the community of Muncie is in the middle of welcoming and helping to resettle over 60 Afghan refugees. And I'm told that there are several other Afghan families now hoping to come to Muncie because they have heard how supportive our community has been in this interfaith effort. Bishop Jennifer's presentation will be followed by remarks from our panelists, each of whom I will introduce later. So let's please give a warm welcome to the Right Reverend Jennifer Baskerville Burroughs. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by frankly thanking George Wolf for this invitation to be with you. George has done the thing that I most cherish as I seek to build relationships in my still new home here in Indiana, which is he followed up. <laughs> when we met last summer at the Chautauqua Institute, he promised to be in touch about working together once we returned home. And now, here we are. And I have to say that this seemingly small thing, this act of meeting and then following up and keeping your word, is critical to making any headway in the work of dismantling structural racism and white supremacy. It's simple sometimes. Meeting, following up, and keeping your word. It is perhaps an understatement to say that we are trying to do something that is incredibly difficult. In taking down the structures that would reinforce a narrative and a reality that keeps us separated and segregated and perpetually fighting for the inherent worth and dignity of all the children of God. As the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Indianapolis, I serve as the chief pastor, chief preacher, teacher, administrator of some 47 congregations across central and southern Indiana, including Grace Episcopal Church right here in Muncie. My life consists of visiting each one of these congregations in a rotation, Sunday by Sunday, and I get to them about every 18 to 24 months. And when there are celebrations or special programs like this or opportunities for fellowship, I get to them more often than that. So let's just say, over the last five years, I've had a deep dive in getting to know about two-thirds of the state of Indiana. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the Diocese of Indianapolis, which we describe as standing with the vulnerable and marginalized to transform systems of injustice. It is one of the five pillars that forms the core mission of what we are about as Episcopalians in Indiana. We began to shape that mission and that identity in 2018, about a year after I was consecrated bishop. But let me back up a little bit and give you a little bit more background about how I got here. You'll want to know that I am a person who identifies as a Black and Shinnecock Indian woman from New York City. And I never expected to find that I would be making my home here in Indiana. Back in 2016, when I entered the, the discernment and election process, which is how we call bishops in our tradition, there is deep discernment nationally and an election. And I was invited to discern being bishop here, and I had all kinds of presumptions about what Indiana was like. Perhaps you know what I mean. Stories about the Ku Klux Klan loomed large in my initial understanding of Indiana history, and those stories were not exaggerated. As the ABC affiliate in Indianapolis, WRTV, reported a few years ago, there was a time in the 1920s when being seen as a good, upstanding Hoosier meant joining the Ku Klux Klan. And at its peak, the Klan counted among its members the governor of Indiana, more than half of the state legislature, and an estimated 30% of all native-born white men in the state." Close quote. 
But when I finally read the profile for what the Diocese of Indianapolis was searching for in its next bishop, I discovered that things, at least in the Episcopal Church, had changed. One sentence in particular still stands out to me. It was a graphic in one of the supplemental materials for the bishop's search, the ways in which they wanted to advertise what kind of bishop they were looking for. And one of the graphics had in big type, we wonder why when we gather at diocesan convention, the annual convention, we wonder why we are so white. So if you're here in the Diocese of Indianapolis, you know that this was something that I could not resist wanting to know more about. I thought that if the diocese, any diocese, any congregation of Christians was willing and able to wonder about that out loud for all the world to see, then I wanted to know more about them. And so as the Holy Spirit and the people of God would have it, I was elected and consecrated, breaking a stained glass ceiling, being the first black female diocesan bishop in the Episcopal Church, which I am convinced really could have only happened, happened here in Indiana. Folks from other parts of the country don't really get it, but they have to understand that once you get here, you understand some of the work that has been going on for decades to make inroads in the areas of race, class, and gender. So today I'm in the fifth year of my episcopacy, and in our diocese we are talking about race not just here and there and in the corners, but we're talking about it everywhere. And sometimes I get myself into trouble when I leave my little bubble of the Episcopal Church and I get into a conversation with someone talking quite matter of factly about dismantling structural racism and white supremacy and it becomes clear that I've used words that some people perceive as divisive or strange or threatening. I've been on too many Zoom meetings and kind of caught myself as people are, did she say those words out loud? <laughs> And I do, because that's how we talk about it. We are trying to normalize the language that we use and the words that we choose matter. It is a part of how we discuss and discern the way forward in the ways that we want to participate in transforming the world by naming things in order to transform them for the better. That's not to say that it's easy or that everyone wants to have this conversation but like all conversations about race and white supremacy, what we are doing in our neck of the woods is profound and challenging work. And as a black woman in authority, helping to provide, nurture, and sustain the spaces where a majority of my community, which is white, can have these conversations, I find this work actually to be liberating, exhausting, but also transformative. Once when I wondered out loud what makes it possible for us to talk so openly about dismantling structural racism, one of our deacons, a wise woman named Kathy Scott, responded by saying, we can't avoid talking about it because it is everywhere. And that's true. White supremacy is everywhere. And even now I marvel that God would call me to serve here. In addition to the widespread embrace of the Ku Klux Klan a century ago between 1860 and 1940, you may know that Indiana was home to some 200 sundown towns, places where it was not illegal for blacks to live, just nearly impossible. If black people were in one of those towns and wanted to live, they needed to be out by sundown. You couldn't stay there. Signs were usually posted at the edge of town, making that very clear. And as you know, may know that sundown towns were one of the ways that the North dealt with Jim Crow. It must be said that we are indebted to a man named James Lowen, the noted sociologist and historian and author who had been researching sundown towns for decades. I met him in 2008 when his book, Sundown Towns, was published. I was living in Syracuse at the time and we were fascinated by what he was telling many of us for the first time. So when I became bishop of the Diocese of Indianapolis, I remember going to the back of his book and going through the index and was stunned at how many of those places were in Indiana. 
Lowen died last fall, but his work continues thanks to his children and researchers and an open source platform at the History and Social Justice website, where others, including, for instance, churches across the country who are doing research on the legacy of slavery and segregation, can contribute to filling out the map of suspected and known sundown towns. Those of you here in the Episcopal Church may have heard this. This is my favorite anecdote to tell about my introduction to Indiana and sundown towns. And it was formative in understanding how doing the work of talking about the things that are sometimes really difficult to talk about can be transformative. It happened when I made my first visitation to St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in New Harmony in October 2017. New Harmony, as you know, was founded as a utopian community, the site of Paul Tillich's grave. It's a place where art and music and the harmonist style are plentiful. And as I arrived in town for the first time, didn't know anything about New Harmony, I was immediately impressed by the hospitality. St. Stephen's had put celebrate Bishop Jennifer signs at a couple of points around town, like not even close to the church. So as I came off the, the county road to come into downtown New Harmony, <laughs> there were these celebrate Bishop Jennifer signs. Of course, what I later learned was that those wonderful welcome signs had been placed where the sundown signs used to be once upon a time. So before I had ever come to show up at that congregation, the priest there and the vestry, the leadership body, had been talking intentionally about how to acknowledge their history, how to change it going forward, change the story about that place this beautiful artistic utopian community. It was a beautiful gesture that generated some really important conversations, both internal and external, about a previously unspoken history. The internal conversation involved the acknowledgement of something quite shameful in some ways. I mean, none of these folks were in that place when those signs were once there, but they had inherited that legacy having moved to that town. But the external conversation brought me and other members of the New Harmony community so much closer together as we began a dialogue about what those welcome signs were signifying beyond mere hospitality. This kind of truth telling engendered some trust and deepened the relationship between that congregation and me immediately. Now you might be thinking that the political and social climate has changed a lot since 2017. We've been through a lot. <laughs> to say the least. But when we're talking about race and diversity, trust can be a whole lot harder to come by. And in many places, you know, we, you'd be right. But this is why I'm hopeful that we're talking about this not just in our faith community, but between faith communities. So gatherings like this, where we have folks of very, very different faiths coming together can really make a difference. People of faith who care for the spiritual health of their people and their communities have to be about having these difficult conversations. Religious spaces ought to be the places that we can bring the most vexing and sensitive challenges. Not long ago, after the murder of George Floyd in 2020, I spoke in a panel discussion on race and anti-black hatred that was hosted by one of the synagogues in Indianapolis. The invitation could be made, first of all, because of the relationship and trust that I had with, rabbis, with Rabbi Dennis and Rabbi Sandy Sasso. We could share our truth and our struggle and listen to one another for ways to be better allies, but also to be more than that. We can listen for ways to be proactive in dismantling structural racism and the forces that feed anti-Semitism. I am clear that the lasting change that we desire will only come when we work together across race, class, and religious lines. Do Christians need to have these conversations in our sanctuaries and fellowship halls? Absolutely. And when we are called to have these conversations beyond our small groups, beyond our buildings, out in the communities where we are too often prone to forget the very lessons our faith teaches us in the pew, we have to be courageous to remember that we can't just turn off what we feel or what we think about these things because we live in the world. 
and God willing, we live in places full of all kinds of people with whom you would desire to have real, meaningful relationship. And when we are able to muster that courage and to find ourselves speaking about race and racial injustice with a vocabulary that can transcend religious faith lines, then we are doing that deep work of building beloved community and seeking reconciliation and deepening relationship across all kinds of lines of difference. One of the ways that we keep trying to do that in our diocese is by being clear that the work of dismantling racism and white supremacy is not a program or initiative or one book that you can read. This work is central to what we understand to be faithful discipleship, what it means to be a Christian. It's not an add-on or a seasonal thing that we only do or talk about during Black History Month or when the headlines demand that we pay attention to something disturbing. God is calling us to offer bold witness and radical welcome and the sin of racism, as we describe it, limits our ability to be faithful. And so we have to be intentional and relentless in recognizing the ways in which these things show up as we try to transform the systems that sustain it. Dismantling systemic racism means nothing short of developing for us a new identity, an identity as a people committed to understanding that all of our systems and institutions and outcomes, even our churches, emanate from the racial hierarchy in which this country was built. And to claim God's promise of freedom and new life in Christ is to walk alongside our neighbors and claim a new identity that is not captive to a systemic racism and the ways in which it divides us one from another. Once we have come to terms with our need not just to change our ways but to change our identity, I think the most powerful way that we as Christians talk about systemic racism is grounded in the biblical and theological concept of the omago dei, the image of God. In the creation narrative in the first chapter of Genesis, God completes the work of calming the chaos and creating all living things and then decides to create humankind. Chapter one, verse 26 of Genesis says, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So to see the diversity of humankind is to understand that the image of God is complex. There have been many interpretations of the Imago Dei throughout Christian tradition, and many others, I'm sure. And some of these interpretations have found that the human reflection of the divine in physical resemblance, in the capacity to reason, and in the power to exercise dominion over creation. But a more modern view contends that the image of God describes life in relationship. The image of God is not constructed from a set of physical or intellectual attributes, but rather by transcending the self through relationship. Put simply, to be created in God's image is to be in relationship. Christians understand that God and the Holy Trinity exhibits perfect relationship in community. By creating humanity not in a solitary state, but as a relational form from the very beginning, God establishes that to be created in God's image means to be in relationship. And so for us to discount a portion of humanity, to say that one portion of humanity is not as worthy as the other, is to discount the fullness of God. We cannot be one if some are part of the image of God and others are not. So as chief pastor and teacher in the Episcopal Diocese of Indianapolis, I have the privilege and responsibility of encouraging our people to embrace this understanding of the image of God, sometimes by having really hard conversations about white supremacy and anti-blackness and white privilege and racism and anti-Asian hate and on and on and on. The fact that we are a mostly white denomination does not exempt us from these conversations. Indeed, it makes them all the more important and urgent. I encourage our entirely white congregations to talk about race on their own before attempting to do so with people of color with whom they have no or little relationship. And as is the case for a lot of our church, many of our congregations in Indiana do not reflect the diversity of their neighborhoods. And so if we want to change our identity, not only as individuals, 
but also as congregations. If we're to embrace the fullness of God and greater commitment to God's mission, we have to have those hard conversations with one another first. So yes, we do the anti-bias and anti-racism trainings and book discussions and the like, but in conversation after conversation, we put those trainings and intellectual experiences to work. And I encourage people to go beyond that question from the bishop profile about why our convention is so white, why do we all look the same, to ask, why does our parish look the way it does? Who is in my friendship circle? Who do I allow at my dining table when we're not in a pandemic? <laughs> Who has access to the things that I value most, like my faith? Do they only look like me? It comes down to some real practical things, building beloved community. It means getting outside our comfort zone, sometimes going to a different gas station in a different neighborhood to remind ourselves that the world is varied and different and beautiful. The hard truth of it is that, for the Episcopal Church particularly, many of our congregations are made up of people who have the power to affect policies and programs and money. And if we are not actively dismantling white supremacy as part of our understanding of what it means to be people of faith, then we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? If we're not giving away our power and centering the voices on the margins, then we ought not to be surprised when people are suspicious of us, when our actions don't line up with what we proclaim with our faith. So we have to have those conversations. And increasingly, we need to have them across all kinds of lines. For transformation to really happen and to really stick, we, all of us, need to be talking together and learning the language that best allows us to enter into a hard conversation in order to make for the change that we most desire. It is no small challenge to back up our words with truly transformative action. And yet I'm hopeful because we're here today making a step, trying to have the conversation, trying to learn, reflect, and attempt change. Dismantling systemic racism and building beloved community is essential to our understanding of God and our witness to God's love. And we who are called to undertake this work with one another, in relationship with one another, with people of every faith and none, we see it as an ongoing practice of growing in faithful maturity. For us, it is nothing less than learning to live and love in our tradition like Jesus because we see God in the other no matter what they look like, no matter their race, their class, their station in life, because all, all are built, created in the image of God. And building beloved community is the slow and certain work of living more close to one another in relationship so that we can build it together. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. How do I get this? Is the mic on? Can everyone hear me? Oh, good. Okay, good. Well, Bishop Jennifer talked a lot about conversation, the importance those conversations are, and even the tough conversations we need to engage in, especially across uh, religious lines. And so now this part of our program is about having that conversation with our panelists. And I'm delighted to first introduce Elite Gertzenson. Elite is a member of the Jewish community in town. Uh, she's also a wonderful classical pianist. She uh, teaches honors classes at uh, Ball State University and has developed, done a lot of research in developing programs about music of Holocaust composers. I've been very fortunate enough to do a program with her called Forgive, Forbidden Sounds, uh, which we did in Indianapolis and several other places for churches as well. And so now I'm turning over the floor to Gaylit so she can uh, comment from her experience uh, as a, someone who comes from Israel and as a member of the Jewish community. Thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure. 
pleasure and honor to be among uh, all of you. And uh, Bishop Jennifer, um, I, I was very moved by your talk. Thank you for that. Um, I am not sure where to start. I arrived to Muncie, Indiana in 2010 for personal reasons. I met my husband uh, and, and moved here. And um, I began teaching at Ball State Honors College in 2018. And one of my um, lecture preparations, I um, came across a photo of the KKK convention taking place in Muncie, Indiana. I think it was 1930, but I'm not quite um, certain about the, the year. Um, and 30,000 people attended this convention. So here I was, um, someone who grew up in Israel. Uh, I grew up Jewish, I'm a, a daughter and, and granddaughter of Holocaust survivors and Holocaust victims. And here I was in Indiana uh, teaching a majority of students who are Hoosiers. Um, and what is it that I can teach them? What kind of questions may they ask me about my heritage? And, and do they know the questions? Um, so I am teaching them the one thing that I know best, and that is stories told in sound, stories from the Holocaust told in sound, in instrumental music, and in vocal. And we are met with difficult um, facts about the fraught past that took place both in Europe and here in the United States. And just one uh, observation that I had uh, came across. The Second World War ended in 1945, and a lot of those uh, former Nazi officers who were then um, brought to justice for those uh, discriminatory legislations, uh, that ended in Europe, while several decades afterwards, those same legislations continued in the US. Uh, so that brings difficult questions, and my, my little contribution as, as a, a Jewish a woman and, um, and someone who had experienced that generational trauma of those people who survived the Second World War, um, I need to teach my students about tolerance, and the way I do this is by teaching them uh, about musicians who wrote their music while incarcerated in concentration camps. Some of them survived and some of them, unfortunately, many of them had, um, had the same death date due to their deportation to Auschwitz at the same time and their extermination in the gas chambers at the same time. Um, it is always surprising for me that every semester I teach the, my course on music on the Holocaust, I ask my students questions and they do not know about um, the events. And this is not just my observation. Uh, this is just um, a few years ago, the, the conference on uh, Jewish material claims against Germany found a alarming lack of knowledge about the Holocaust in the United States. So what is it that I can do? I can tell the stories, we can listen to the music, and really what it, what it, we're not always just listening to music, we're listening to testimonies. And those testimonies can be the harsh sounds that victims had experienced and then put into music. These can be poems that put into music. And these can be a real artifact of performances that took place and were documented in photos. I, I know that this is a small contribution, but this is the little that I can do. And um, I'm fortunate to do this, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I think that others would like to speak as well. So um, thank you for having me again, and um, I'd, I'd be looking forward to hearing you. Thank you, Gilead. Yes, um, 
program that we perform together, uh, there are two pieces that I perform uh, in the program. And one is uh, written for saxophone, and the other was written for oboe that I'm performing on saxophone. And they're excellent pieces, but it's really symbolic for me to be performing uh, in that program because, number one, the saxophone was uh, basically looked down upon in Germany as being a Jewish instrument. And here I am, you know, reviving this and performing on the saxophone. Of course, the Nazis allowed the saxophone to be in their military bands. That goes to show you the contradictions. But uh, yeah, and but these are, it's a, a very meaningful opportunity that I've had in connecting with you for that particular uh, program. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Human Baharami, and uh, he is from the Baha'i community, uh, and he'll be. He, he also is a, a director of pharmacy at the community hospital in Anderson. So we're happy to have him here, Roman. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Bishop Jennifer. And uh, um, I may have to go for, go for Golet. And Golet, for your remarks, it was uh, certainly very moving and inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, obviously, um, you know, uh, as a member of the Baha'i faith, we um, believe in oneness of mankind. That's one of the central beliefs of uh, Baha'i faith. Um, in um, writings of Baha'i faith, um, the race unity has been emphasized greatly. Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, addressed humanity in mid-19th century with these words. Um, the tabernacle of unity had been raised, regarding not one another as strangers. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch, which uh, echoes what uh, Bishop Jennifer was saying, that uh, God has created all of us in image of uh, himself or herself. And uh, you know, the colors, the external characteristics that we have are things that unifies humanity. Those are just like um, um, flowers of different color. That's how Baha'is view uh, different uh, hues of skin color that exist in the human world. And um, um, actually, um, in the same time period that um, Bishop Jennifer was referring to when um, in uh, mid 1920s and um, 30s, Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy was very prevalent, not just in the um, state of Indiana, but throughout uh, the United States. Uh, the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, his name is Abdul Baha, traveled throughout the United States, bringing the message of the Baha'i faith to this continent. And uh, in one of those um, travels, he uh, gave a speech at uh, Howard University, which is the first uh, historically black college and university, as many of you know. And um, in his speech, uh, I have excerpts of it. Uh, probably should read it because uh, I probably wouldn't do a good job of uh, trying to uh, summarize it. But uh, uh, basically, um, he said, uh, I'm happy to be here today for I see white and black sitting together. He then proceeded to reject the notion of racial essentialism, which I guess was a prevalent theory of the time that regarded um, a person's worth based on their color or their level of humanity based on their color of their skin. And he uh, further, at the end of his uh, speech, concluded by saying, there are no whites and blacks before God. All, color, all colors are one, and that is the color of servitude to God. Scent and color are not important. The heart is important. If the heart is pure, white or black or any color makes no difference. Prejudice, obviously, has been a cause of animosity throughout humankind history. It's been a source of wars, uh, be it uh, World War II or World War I and 
also very much a uh, cause of uh, war even back in uh, biblical times. And uh, all those prejudices are things that um, are essential to be removed for us to live in a peaceful and harmonious world. Uh, the Baha'is believe that uh, um, the promises that are made in many religions about a time that humanity will live in complete peace and harmony uh, is uh, at hand. It is not something that uh, will happen um, um, in you know decades or um, centuries from now. We feel we believe that it is the time that those prophecies and those promises will come true and the essential step for achieving those promises and prophecies is for us to sincerely search our souls and hearts and remove traces of prejudice that we have for others and uh, view each other as children of one God and those uh, promises uh, will be fulfilled and we will see um, the prayer that uh, Christ uh, said in Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven will be fulfilled. So uh, we all uh, pray for that day and uh, it, it uh, also requires some work from each of us by eliminating sources of prejudice in our, our lives and speaking out against it as uh, Bishop Jennifer mentioned, if we know, see somebody's being um, treated unjustly based on color, based on uh, their religious beliefs or their um, other uh, beliefs that they may have, we need to speak out. We need to make sure we uh, not only um, don't have those prejudices inside ourselves, that also we speak out against it if we see it. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Yeno Matuka. Uh, Dr. Matuka taught uh, in the English department at Ball State University for many years. He and I have been good friends uh, for many years. Uh, he is a great resource of uh, African uh, parables and wisdom teachings. Uh, he goes to Hazelwood Christian Church, but he came from the Congo, and he speaks many languages, by the way, uh, as, as, a, as a linguist. Um, well, years ago, uh, well, about 20 years ago, uh, I had an interfaith uh, radio show uh, locally here, and I interviewed various people. I have, they're, all, they're also available online, by the way, if anybody wants to <laughs> go through and resurrect them. But uh, I interviewed Matuka for one of the shows, and he talked about uh, the African parables that were meaningful to him, sources of wisdom. Uh, so I'm delighted to have him here as one of our panelists. Matuka. Hello. This one. Thank you, George, for inviting me, and thank you for opportunity of receiving uh, Bishop Jennifer, and thank you for participating. Um, I have been in this country for quite a while. I'm sure some of you may have seen me around. I did teach at Ball State for 21 and a half years uh, in the English department uh, before retiring. So I would like to share with you uh, what George would like me to actually um, discuss in a way. It is the concept of Ubuntu. Um, actually, in my native language of Kikongo, it is Bumuntu. Um, so I will read uh, what I have prepared for remarks so that my ideas are a bit clearer than just talking disorderly. Um, <clears throat> so in my Bantu native language of Kikongo, of Western Democratic Republic of the Congo, 
this concept of Ubuntu is known as Bumuntu. In a nature, the fact of being a person or a human being. I have read uh, online the following definition of some, some sort. Ubuntu is a complex word from the Nguni language with several definitions of all of them difficult to translate into English. So you can imagine the difficulty of telling you what it is to be a Muntu or Bumuntu. Uh, therefore, Ubuntu or Bumuntu is a concept that can be explained in many ways and examples can help us to sort of uh, make some sense for those who are not Muntu or Bantu. So the plural of Muntu is Bantu. One person is a Muntu, more than one, Bantu. Let me start by saying that I myself am a Muntu, meaning one person from the Bantu ethnic group of Central through Southern Africa. I would like you to know or to notice, to note, to note that it's a paradoxical thing to say, but although Muntu means person, a Caucasian or an Oriental person cannot be called simply Muntu because he or she would lack the features that characterize a Muntu. In its restricted sense, a Muntu must be defined as a human being whose ancestors originate from the tropical region of Central Africa and went all the way through the Southern Africa in the continent. But let me come back to the concept of Ubuntu, or I would be saying Bumuntu, because it's my native language. One definition of the concept of Ubuntu is that it is the spirit of Bumuntu, which is essentially about togetherness and how all of our actions have an impact on others on society and society. So from the theoretical definition I found on, in Wikipedia, an African concept referring to humanness. It gives expressions, expression to deeply held African ideas of one personhood being rooted in one's interconnectedness with others. The writer in Wikipedia adds, Ubuntu is a Nguni Bantu term meaning humanity. Well, if it is Nguni, and Nguni being a sub-African, let's say sub-ethnic group of uh, the Bantu, I will, I will just say it's a Bantu concept. It is sometimes translated as I am because we are. Or humanity towards others. Think of being humane towards others. Um, in Osa, one of the Southern African languages, the latter term is used, but it, it is often meant uh, to be more philosophical, and the philosophical sense of the belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects of hu humanity. The Congo people also have, uh, have it. The Congo people, meaning the one I am representing right now. <laughs> in kinship relationship, you might hear a Mukongo introduce a person named Aloni saying, Aloni is me. Contradiction, but that's what you might hear. Aloni is me. It means Aloni and the speaker share the same blood, 
no matter how far back this biological connection had taken place. And that is, even if Aloni is from the country of Angola or Congo Brazzaville, and the speaker is from the Congo of Kinshasa, that's the Democratic Republic of the Congo, that's the same, per same person. These are the countries on which the Congo clans spread from Mbanza Congo in Angola, the original land of the Congo Kingdom, where many African Americans came from. So the Congo people even believe in a certain form of incarnation. That is, for instance, if a white person loves a black person as they would love their own family member, chances are that in uh, their pre-life, White, that white person used to be a black person of the same extended family as the black person. This is to me, this sounds like a metaphysical yet human connection embedded in the soul of a Congo person or Congo. Obviously, the word togetherness evokes a word that is part of the subsequent definition available across the languages of Southern Bantu ethnic group. That, that is connectedness. Hence, a kind of bonding that exists or should exist between people. A good question to ask is, how does, how does this bonding manifest itself among the Bantu people? who naturally practice the concept of Bumundu. I will start with the definition taken from Wikipedia. Ubuntu is correct behavior. But correct in this sense is defined by a person's relations with other people. Ubuntu refers to behaving well towards others or acting in ways that benefit the, com the community. Such acts could be as simple as uh, helping a stranger in need, or much more complex ways of relating with others. A person who behaves in these ways has Ubuntu, or Bumuntu, that is. He or she is full, a full person. Think of it, a full person. Among the Congo people, for example, it is good behavior to respect the social cultural value of sharing embedded in the saying, food is better shared than stuffed in one person's stomach although capitalism has practically destroyed this high third of common sense. Another behavior that helps to define a person as a full Muntu, that is a good, well-behaved, or reputed human being, or even a role model, is knowing who is who in the village. One way of bonding for the Congo people used to be knowing one's clan so that you assign titles or, of respect and roles to, a, to, a, to appropriate individuals in the village. This also created a sense of belonging. If you are a stranger, knowing whose clan a person belongs to in the village will help you to know who would be your maternal or paternal clan's male or female person, uncle or aunt? Who is your maternal or paternal cousin, nephew or niece, and who is related to you by marriage? Thanks to this social cultural awareness, as you can see, a Muntu is never a real stranger in any Congo community. 
But even if he is or she is a stranger, the concept of uh, bumundu requires that someone will host such a person. The person hosting this person is a real mundu, one who has bumundu, who will welcome strangers as if they were their own family members. They do so by accommodating them, feeding them, and if they were staying for a longer time, as did the refugees from Angola in the 60s and 70s, when they were fighting for freedom from Portugal, they would give them land to build a home and work on it. Bumuntu has a spiritual sense too, which is why sometimes it, it, it is seen as if it were something akin to a soul force, an actual metaphysical connection shared between people and which helps us connect to each other. Ubuntu or Bumuntu will push one toward selfless act. I have been living in the United States for 37 years now, but that soul force still operates my sense of connectedness with my extended family members in Congo. I help my brothers, my half-brother, who, who paid actually my middle school, my middle and high school education. Um, he didn't have a very good income, but he shared, and that's what selfless act is about. I assist my sister, my nephews, nieces, and cousins in dire need of something for survival. Here in Mansi, I have been trying to exercise this spirit by belonging to a church, joining Mansi Community Exchange, and doing something for someone, including making donations <laughs> when I can. Recently, I heard from a niece living in Kinshasa that the extended family members in the city have created a mutual fund they call Vaki Mosi, a Congo way, way of saying the oneness group. This kind of group is the manifestation of the spirit of togetherness or connectedness, bonding for the community. Therefore, it is a clear manifestation of Umundu in its restricted sense. In its general manifestation among the Congo, the practical behavior is that whenever there is a funeral, a wedding, or a reconciliation event caused by a dispute between members of the community, the spirit of Ubuntu requires that a full Ubuntu, a well-behaved human being, attend the ritual. He or she is expected to be helpful there. And of course, he will also expect others to assist him or her in case of trouble. My last quote is another from Wikipedia. Ubuntu also, referred to, also refers to the need for forgiveness and reconciliation rather than <coughs> vengeance. It was an underlying concept in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the writings of Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu. This was raised, this, this helped to raise awareness of the term Ubuntu. And President Obama actually included this in um, his memorial um, for Nelson Mandela, saying it was a concept that Mandela embodied and taught to millions. That is my contribution. I hope you understand something about what it means to be a Muntu and what Bumuntu is actually um, as a concept. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, we'll complete our panel discussion with uh, Reverend Pamela, adding some words. No, 
she has a background which uh, I think made her especially interested in this particular event. From the things people have shared, we could have like, you know, an hour or more conversation about each thing. Um, but I know our, our time here is limited. Um, so I, I kind of go for the practical, um, like what are things we can do uh, specifically? So much of what Bishop Jennifer said, like, is exactly what I have found in my own research. I've been studying um, this for a number of years, and I know I've, I'm just scraping the, the tip of the iceberg. I know it's, and I appreciated her talking, it's a lifelong journey. It's not just a, a, a one-time thing, or for this year, we're going to study this, and then we've got it covered. Um, I will back up, and I will actually share a little embarrassing thing about me. Um, so I grew up in Indiana. I grew up just a little bit north of here um, in a small town. And uh, at the time I was a child, the population of Indiana was 98.6% white. And so in the middle of Indiana, you know, and so our minorities tended to be both either up around Chicago or down around Louisville. And so I really didn't have any exposure to anyone of another um, background. But my parents did, you know, rate, did talk about it, even though... They, you know, they weren't part of our everyday life. They did talk about how people are, you know, loved by God or, and everybody's equal. Um, so I grew up with that understanding. But when I got to Ball State as an undergrad, I can remember all these years later that I, and I'm, this is the embarrassing part, I wrote a paper in one of my history classes where I said that the people today, you know, so this was several decades ago, who were, who were descended from slaves were no more affected by slavery today than I was. Talk about ignorant. Talk about not fully understanding the repercussions of the history and how it's passed down. And I'm really distraught that my professor did not push back against that um, in comments on my paper. Um, Fortunately, God did not leave me in that state of ignorance. And through friendships, through education, through seminary, through churches I've been involved in, um, and then just a lot of study on the side, taking trainings, event, you know, I've, I have learned a lot. And the conclusion that I've come to kind of comes back a lot to what Reverend Jennifer said from the Christian perspective. That Imago Day, that we are created in the image of God, to me, that is central. And we say that, you know, God loves all of humanity regardless of color, regardless of gender, regardless of social status, and that is so very true. But we really have to be careful that we don't take that a little too far and then say, so then I'm colorblind. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Say, oh, well, I'm colorblind. I'm the thing is, if you're honestly colorblind, then you aren't really seeing the person. So we have to be careful, I think, as white people, that we don't think that we've, you know, totally moved beyond racism. I know I, I've had people say, oh, that was so long ago. Y'all, Ruby Bridges is still alive. This, this is not that removed. And the repercussions, the the part that is hard, I think, for a lot of white people to understand is racism is not just an individual, like how I act and um, how, I, how I teach my children to act. There is the systemic, the structural, it, there really is, and the more that you learn about it, the more astounding it is, the barriers that have been placed in front of our black brothers and sisters to overcome. Um, the um, Bread for the World, which is an ecumenical organization to try to stamp out hunger, they have a phenomenal simulation where you, it's like a little game that you can play that kind of takes you through some events in history, and you're assigned whether you're black or white for the purposes of the game, and then repercussions happen 
where you either get money or, and or opportunity cards. And so then at the end of the simulation, you get to see, you know, the disparity. And we did this at uh, the Kentucky Council of Churches, um, one of our assemblies, and it was really eye-opening. Um, for example, I did not know prior to that simulation, I did not know that the, um, um, oh, I just went blank on what we call it, the GI Bill um, that helped so many people move into the middle class was really for whites. It was not an opportunity that was open to blacks. And I see a lot of you nodding your heads like, yes, you knew that. But there's a lot of people out there that still don't understand that, and they don't understand how, um, how what did happen for 400 years of our history, those repercussions have not been undone, and we are not all on level playing fields. And I love what um, Bishop Jennifer said about we've got to talk about this among ourselves, um, our congregations, our faith groups, our families, you know, our friends. When you hear people say things that aren't true, I think our instinct is to just stay silent. And as a person of faith, I, I think we, we are called to not stay silent. And uh, I will offer you this thing to think about. When you picture Jesus, what does he look like? Um, so many representations of Jesus, God, are very white. I remember a banner being in one of my churches where Jesus was as pale as I am, or maybe even paler, and, and with blue eyes. And I was like, you know, that's really nice because I got blue eyes, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that Middle Eastern, you know. And a lot of people don't take this seriously, but I think until we can picture God and Jesus as not white, it will be hard to recognize the image of God in all of our brothers and sisters of color. And so part of my mission um, is, is to, to call this to, to, to um, folks' attention. You know, when you're picking out the children's curriculum, are the people in the pictures all white? Or, you know, the Bible stories, um, they, should, they should look like Middle Eastern people. Um, there's just so many. I did, I, and when I was in seminary, I did a major research project around this topic of the intersection of sexism and racism in the history of Christianity. And it was very eye-opening. And like I said, there's, I, I could just go on and on, but I'm going to stop talking um, and just say that I'm so grateful for this opportunity uh, for us to be in this space and to, to think about these things. And um, I will share, in closing, I'll share this quote from Patricia J. Williams. This, I pulled this from my uh, research paper. Um, the power of imagination cannot be underestimated as it supplants our knowledge of physical reality and is more powerful than our rational knowledge. Sometimes the truth of things is hard to grasp if it's obscure, obscured by the associations, the images that are put in our heads by the lessons we learn in home or school, by the messages drilled into us by media. And I would add that Christianity helped to perpetuate this privileged privileging of white bodies, not only through racialized interpretations of scripture, but through the use of the visual images as well. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have a we have some moments here. Uh, does anyone have any questions uh, in the audience they would like to, to bring up or ask or comments? Yes. I know who your friend is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I 
think it's individual for the background that each of us had grew up with. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, those who have um, lived through terror or um, any sort of a, a political a turbulence um, may have those um, those habits. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but uh, I, I, this is not anything within the religious practice, now that I know, but, but we may uh, share the names afterwards. <laughs> Anybody else? I have a, a question for Bishop Jenner. Uh, when I was at Indiana University in the School of Music, I took a course, took two courses, one in jazz history, one in, one in black music in America, and taught by David Baker, a great uh, professor. And uh, it awakened me to what we would, what we would call the African American culture, and how uh, it's all ingrained in the music that evolved in, in the uh, music of American jazz, and also how there was, they, they, had, they had had to manipulate through the racism of the time, just an example, the big bands of the 30s and so forth were, had, had bands with a lot of black musicians in, and they were mostly playing for white audiences. And then until the bebop movement came, uh, then that's when jazz became really a protest music. Um, you could no longer dance to it, for example. Uh, so but what it awakened to me was uh, the difference in, in culture, and it, but it enabled me to have a, a deeper understanding of black culture and African culture, and as a result, I think I feel, and from then I felt much more comfortable being in a setting where there were people uh, from the black community. So I'm asking, how much do you think uh, the, the, the racial divide is complicated by not understanding culture? I feel like answer, trying to answer that question will get me into trouble around disciplines I don't fully know about. <laughs> um, because I think the issue of cultural appropriation is one that is it's complicated, and yet it, it's operating all the time. And we don't know how to talk about that either, as we learn to both have appreciation for other cultures and find thresholds lowered so that we could begin to approach people of different cultures, it goes both ways. There's always the assumption though, I think for people of color that the way the direction goes is that you are supposed to aspire to and want to know about um, European white culture in order to be able to assimilate enough to function in this country. But going the other way becomes complicated. And um, I think your, your, your question is layered in complication, but what I would say is that but we need to find ways of understanding each other more deeply and by finding ways to um, offer invitation to get to know each other's culture. So in the Episcopal Church, and I'm gonna come around this and hope that I can get to the, something that's helpful with your question. In the Episcopal Church, what I find myself saying to people is that we are a church that was started by the Church of England. We are a colonialist denomination in this country and across the world, and yet the reality is, is that while we are singing lots of European and Anglo music in our sanctuaries most Sundays, the experience of the Anglican communion worldwide is majority black, and that we ought to be having spirituals, drums, and all kinds of things if we're going to be truly worshiping in our contemporary Anglican tradition but that gets really hard because we don't have those people, we don't have people of color in America in our pews. And so what we do in our country, following a mostly European white um, English tradition is a sliver of the culture of the Anglican tradition in 2022. It's a very, it's a minority experience that we hold on to. And so I'm trying to encourage our majority white congregations to find the ways to have voice to sing spirituals, to find ways with appreciation for the vast musical tradition in our denomination, to sing the full tradition. And I think if we are entering into 
conversations and experiences that are about appreciation and curiosity, then we find ourselves having a different conversation about getting to know the breadth of cultures, which we can claim as part of who we are as people sharing this country, this faith, all of these things as entry points that allow us to say, yes, this can be something I can grow to love too, even if I didn't grow up in that culture or don't come out of that particular tradition. I'm not sure if that kind of gets at what you're asking, but it's, a, it's, it's a akin to the conversation around images, which I deleted from my speech because I thought I was going on too long, so I'm so glad that Reverend Pamela said something about it, but the notion that, particularly as people of faith, if we are only experiencing one culture and we live in a diverse environment, like even in like Muncie, then we're doing a disservice. Our images, our music needs to reflect the full diversity of what's possible as a way for us to grow. And you, there are ways that we can do that with appreciation instead of just pure appropriation that doesn't feel good. A very uh, meaningful experience for me, and I hope it has been for you as well. Um, you know, when I was, uh, my son was six years old, he, he taught me a, a real important lesson. Uh, we told him that it's, it is for his sixth birthday that we could have a party and he could invite his friends to come. You know? Now, he couldn't invite the whole class, but he could invite, you know, four, five, six friends to come we'd have for his birthday party. Um, so we're ready to go with the cake and everything, and all of a sudden, four black kids show up to our house. And, you know, we expected him to be inviting the white kids, you know. And then when the parents came, uh, they were expected, they thought we were going to be a black family because all the, <laughs> he, he just blew a hole in our, our assumptions. A lot of this uh, uh, topic really revolves around the assumptions we make, I think. And so he taught. That's a very important lesson at, at, at the time. I was director of Center for Peace and Conflict Studies here at Ball State for, from 2002 to 2006. And one thing I always emphasize is that we need to think of peace not as a noun. We need to think of peace as a verb. Peace is something we have to build. It is an ongoing process. It is not something which, you know, we're sort of lying around eating grapes. <laughs> It's an ongoing process and conversation that we have to continually have. And uh, I'm really uh, pleased that you all came out this afternoon. I really uh, thank you, Bishop Jennifer, for your enlightening presentation. Thank you for the panel. Uh, it was just uh, uh, you know, turned out to meet more than my expectations. Thank you all for coming. I want to close with a, a prayer that uh, was composed by uh, a Frax Franciscan priest who is rather famous. His name is uh, Father Richard Rohr, who I was fortunate also here at uh, Chautauqua Institution. This is, I think, is a truly an interfaith prayer, and I'd like to conclude our event with this, and then afterwards we have refreshments in the rotunda, so we can go there and have some more conversation if you'd like to be Bishop Jennifer. So if it is, uh, if you're comfortable with this, uh, please feel free to bow your heads with me. O oh, great love, thank you for living and loving in us and through us. May all that we do flow from our deep connection with you and all beings. Help us to become a community that vulnerably shares each other's burdens and the weight of glory. Listen to our heart's longings for the healing of our world. knowing that you are hearing us often better than we are speaking. We offer these prayers in all of the holy names of God. Amen. Thank you. I hope to see you in the rotunda. Thank you.